Um, I'm Robert Sigliano, the Director of the Institute of World Affairs, and I want to welcome you and thank you for coming out tonight uh, to hear about a critical issue for us, and, and both Julie Swag and, and Senator Feingold will help uh, illuminate this question, and, and we all have time for questions and answers, obviously, um, b before we break. Um, I want to say a thank you also to the IWA members um, and encourage any of you who are not members. Uh, I'm sure you're all leaning to be members and haven't gotten around to it, but you can take care of that tonight if you like, and we would, we would greatly appreciate that because it helps make programs like this happen. Um, also, if those of you that haven't seen the literature table over here, there's literature um, both from the Stimson Center, which helped put this event on, uh, as well as um, um, from, from the Institute of World Affairs. The, the Stimson Center, Henry L. Stimson Center, as I mentioned, um, really is the, is the group that, that made this event happen. Uh, and we're very thankful for them and their co-sponsorship of this. The, the Stimson Center was founded in 1989. Uh, it's a nonprofit policy institution based in Washington, D.C., dedicated to enhancing international peace and security through rigorous nonpartisan analysis and results-oriented results -oriented approach. And, and they, they, speaking from personal experience, having attended Stimson events on Capitol Hill, they, do, they really fulfill an essential job of briefing our, our members of Congress on very complex and difficult issues uh, related to international affairs, peace, and, and, and security. Here with us uh, is Libby Turpin to represent the Simpson Center. I'll introduce, introduce her in a moment, and she'll introduce uh, our, our, our panel. Uh, I also want to thank, before we get going, I want to thank Milwaukee Public Radio, uh, WWM 89.7, which is taping this program, and we'll rebroadcast it uh, tomorrow uh, uh, at the end, at the at 10 program, 10 a.m. and 10, 10 p.m. Tonight, the format will have uh, Julie Schweig speak first for about 20 minutes, um, and, and then Senator Feingold uh, will speak. We're, all, we're handing out, if you haven't seen them, we have question cards for people to fill out. So if you'd like to submit a written question, uh, please fill that out, and, and um, members of the staff will be through. There are the little orange sheets that are in the uh, packets. Um, you can also use, uh, we'll have some microphones in the audience, so we will also take uh, live questions from the audience as well. Let me introduce uh, Libby Turpin. Libby is a senior associate and co-director of the Security for a New Century project at the, at the Stimson Center. Um, she has uh, experience in national security, nuclear, uh, and nonproliferation issues, and she's beginning to start up a new program within Stimson to focus on those uh, particular issues. What's great about the Stimson Center and the, and the um, Security for a New Century program is the, the two main movers in that Libby Turpin and Lorelai Kelly are also members of, of congressional staffs, one on the Republican side, one on the Democratic side. Um, Libby is, is working with the staff of Senator Luger, previously worked with Senator Pete, Pete Domenici, Republican from New Mexico, uh, was a legislative assistant responsible for defense, nonproliferation, and, and foreign affairs. Libby is an author, uh, co-author of Policy Matters, Educating Congress on Peace and Security. She um, attended University of New Mexico. Is that correct? And uh, has her PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. So without further ado, let me introduce Libby Turpin. There are many other thank yous to be had tonight. Um, I wanted to, before I get into introducing our esteemed uh, speakers tonight, I want to make sure and thank Rob as well as his uh, colleagues at the university who were just Absolutely a crack team and a real pleasure to work with. Um, I'd also like to thank Senator Feingold and his staff for making this happen. Uh, it, took, it takes a lot of back and forth. Staff are very busy, and senators are even busier than their staff members. So it takes a real dedication to make things pull together. Um, all the stars aligned and that managed to come together because of the hard work of, of his staff as well. Um, now I'd like to introduce our panelists, and it's really an honor and a pleasure to, to introduce both uh, Dr. Julia Swag and Senator Feingold, and I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking tonight. Um, Julia Swag is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, where she directs a new project on the global phenomenon of anti-Americanism. Most recently, she served as project director for the Center for Preventive Action Actions Andes 2020 Commission, which culminated in early 2004 with the release of, major new, of a major new strategy for Colombia and the Andean region. In January 2004, Dr. Swig's book entitled Inside the Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro and the Urban Underground, received the American Historical Association's award for the best book of a year by an independent author. 
independent scholar, excuse me. Dr. Swig holds a BA from the University of California and an MA and PhD from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She's authored numerous articles and opinion pieces on Cuban, Latin America, and American foreign policy. Dr. Swig, most importantly to tonight's um, discussion, will be offering us insights gleaned from her extensive research at the Council on anti-Americanism, which I would underscore will be laid out in extensive detail in her forthcoming book entitled Travels in Anti-America. Look for it on shelves, bookstore shelves near you in the near future. Um, and if not, Amazon.com is the next best guess. Um, second on our panel is a person who needs no introduction, uh, judging from the applause when he uh, came up on the stage tonight. But as this is my only time at the mic, I may as well take advantage of it. Um, Senator Russ Feingold graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1975, received a degree from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar in 1977, and then went on to Harvard Law School, where he earned his degree in 1979. In 1982, in his first try for elective office, he defeated a longtime incumbent and was elected to the Wisconsin State Senate for the 27th District. When Senator Feingold first ran for the U.S. Senate in 1992, he won a, three, a tough three-way primary and went on to defeat a two-term incumbent. He has been re-elected to the Senate twice, most recently in 2004, and he currently serves on the Judiciary, Budget, and Foreign Relations Committees, as well as on the Special Committee on Aging. Senator Feingold proudly carries forward Wisconsin's progressive tradition in the U.S. Senate. In addition to the landmark McCain-Feingold bill, his long record of accomplishment includes key leadership in successful efforts to pass the congressional gift ban and lobbying disclosure legislation, among many other reform, necessary reform initiatives. Most important to this evening's forum is Senator Feingold's longstanding service on the Foreign Relations Committee, where he brings a critical focus to the fight against terrorism. As the ranking member of the Africa Subcommittee, he works to focus attention and diplomatic resources on countries in Africa that may be havens for terrorist activity. Also, Senator Feingold has long been an advocate for making human rights a priority in our foreign relations policy in Africa and around the world. In a recent speech, Senator Feingold stated, quote, growing anti-Americanism is a national liability, especially in the fight against terrorism, end of quote. We look very much forward to hearing his ideas on the means to address this global phenomenon and the role U.S. citizens must play as part of our foreign policy strategy. With that, let me thank you all for coming and turn it over to Dr. Julia Swig. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. And Senator Feingold, I want to tell you that it's a pleasure to be here sitting next to you. I've sat across from you testifying in your committee, and it's much more fun to be next to you than it is across from you. Um, and I want to uh, thank Rob and Susan and, and Libby and, and all of you here for, for having me out from Washington. It's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I want to tell you all that I've spent a lot of time working on Latin America, and this is one of the first times I'm going to talk to an audience of this size about this new body of research that I'm just concluding on anti-Americanism, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, because sometimes I feel like I'm writing the great big book of everything. There are so many elements that I think go into trying to understand this current moment that we're living through, and it, it paints a disturbing picture Anti-Americanism during the Cold War um, was sort of confined really to very narrow bands of opinion internationally, to the left, to the right. We saw bursts of anti-Americanism in isolated instances over the Vietnam War, over the Cuban Missile Crisis, over the Euro Missile Crisis. But we didn't really have what I think were moving toward now, which is really a global anti-American default. In the Cold War, because the United States had a sort of a, a nemesis, we had this negative dystopia, the Soviet Union over there, anti-Americanism was contained. It didn't have the capacity to hurt us the way it does today. And I've really focused in much of my research and thinking and will tonight not so much on the anti-Americanism of the 
fundamentalist, jihadist, Muslim groups, but really of the opinion that's coalesced against the United States among those that we've thought of historically as our friends and allies and as our potential partners. Because we, we need friends. We can't be a single superpower forever. We won't be. And in order to deal with so many of the major issues that are on America's security table, but also the globe's table, we simply can't have the kind of isolation that I think is resulting from, from this new default that's coalescing, which is really now, you see it in the polls, and I encourage you all to go online and look at the polls done by the Pew organization, by the German Marshall Fund, by the different Latin American, European, and Asian polling agencies. It's very much a cross-class, cross race, cross ideology phenomena. Hopefully it's not permanent and there's some instances lately of changes in the polling that suggest it may not and, and, and Senator Feingold will speak to some of the ways in which we might be able to stop this in its track. Recently we've seen evidence now way past Abu Ghraib and way past the beginning of the, d the dip in polling about the United States, really we hit a bottom, I would say, in about late 2002, early 2003. But now here we are in 2005, we see these protests that have erupted over allegations of desecrations of the Koran, of the symbolism that the prison at Guantanamo is becoming, the instances in Bagram and Afghanistan, most recently, the First Lady's trip gained some negative attraction from both Jews and, and Arabs in Israel. Even the Manchester United purchase by the owner of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers has, has been cause for this eruption in what we think of as our special friend in the UK of anti-American protests. And of course, the insurgency in Iraq is, is about a lot of things, but it does have a very strong anti-American element. And, and of course, part of this phenomenon is full of caricature. If you go on the blogosphere and you look at what the international media reports, it's very cartoony, the images of the United States and of Americans. But there's something deeper and bigger than the sort of old school Cold War era anti-Americanism going on. And, and I think really you can see it both regionally and on issues. Uh, and you can see it and understand it for a number of different sources. First of all, I would say that, and this is in no particular priority, but one element, and I'll talk through about five elements that I think feed this moment. And, and I think what you'll hear underlying my comments is that although I do think some of this is Bush specific and is policy specific, I do think it's deeper and broader and something that any White House under any party will, will have to contend with. Economic globalization, one important element. In the 1990s, the United States really grabbed onto the idea of globalization and pushed it for the developing world and I think oversold it. The expectations have not, the reality has not met the expectations and there's been great disappointment in the developing world about economic globalization. The end of the Cold War itself and how we as a country digested that moment is incredibly important. I think we haven't had a full public debate about what our role was, sort of the dark side of the Cold War, not just the triumphant we won element of it, but how we won and the meaning of that. And the legacy of our understanding means that we sort of in the 1990s glossed over a bit of that dark side, which those who were on the other side of the gun, if you will, haven't forgotten. Another element, and this is very counterintuitive, but not so much if you think about it for a second, is democracy. Democracy has broken out in many parts of the world where it did not exist before, and it's, and it's nascent and it's brittle, but one of the aspects of, of it is, especially in countries that have been historically American allies, that were run by authoritarians or are now still run by authoritarians but are exposed to the transparency and 24-7 news of globalization is just that societies are more open and to the extent that the United States is associated with the bad guys within societies, we take some of the heat. And I think that even in countries where we were not necessarily clear allies of the dominant regime, we're seeing this. Spain, I'm thinking of in the recent elections there after the bombing and even Italy, for example, and there are many more examples. Another big element of this, and it's not something that the United States can necessarily control, but we can manage it, of course, is power, just raw power. We have a lot of it. 
We have a lot more than we've had in the past. And it, this sets us up for being the target of animus. No matter how well we managed our power, I'm sure that we would be the target of, of lots of jealousies and resentments, as we always have been. We're accustomed to being the elephant in the room. But in the recent era, especially in the last few years, our management of our power has been, in Spanish, the word is torpe, clumsy, and it has gotten us at, into some big trouble. The other element, of course, is policy, right? There have been specific policies, the Iraq war, the excesses of the war on terror, the, the diplomacy around the war in Iraq, very specific developments over the last few years that have organized a coalition, an anti-American coalition, and really begun to set this into what I, what I call the anti-American default. And finally, and I'll, I'll finish up in a few minutes, but finally the last element, and this is one is both about us and about them. You know, there's been an argument that this anti-Americanism is really a clash of civilization and a clash of values, and it's, it has more to do with the French jealousy of us or the German hang-ups about their own history or the South Korea's own um, sort of, and Turkish, and I, I can think of many examples of countries where their own domestic politics have um, fed anti-American nationalism quite independently of the relationship with the United States. So domestic politics everywhere matter, and that's why, of course, the spread of democracy brings with it its own perils, even with its own positives as well. And domestic politics, of course, in the United States is incredibly important. We are, in my view, in the process of moving backwards away from some of the progressive values in the 20th century that made our country a beacon and that gave us the credibility and legitimacy to lead and to, to, to have our ideas triumph in the, the Cold War, uh, not to use that word too much, triumph. We're, by moving away for that from those progressive values, and it's not clear where this will end, but by moving away from that, I think we do run a risk of no longer having the domestic legitimacy at home that gave us the capacity to lead abroad. The consequences of, of this anti-American default that I think is, is now coalescing has spilled over well beyond Iraq and well beyond the war on terror. Even before the September 11th attacks and before the war in Iraq, the United States had begun to be seen internationally as an outlier outside of the consensual mainstream on several important issues, climate change, dealing with infectious diseases, some aspects of pr proliferation on which the United States, because of our history of exceptionalism, has chosen its own path. But now if you, I think if you add up Iraq plus war on terror plus these major global issues on which it seems to be that we are not making progress internationally, the United States is now seen more as an obstacle than as a country that can lead. The open derision one now picks up from foreign diplomats is a big change. Again, I referred to the blogs. The street is much less polite. When my book comes out, we're going to have a website and a blog, and we're going to put links to some of the things there that I can't in polite company talk about. But the, 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 the material out there in the world about America is, is truly chilling, and I think it will have consequences for our ability to get a lot of things done, not only for America's American security, but for the globe's security. Now we saw with, um, excuse me, in the case of the tsunami, that opinion can be turned around. Before the tsunami in Indonesia, the ratings, favorable ratings for the United States were at about 14 percent. Osama bin Laden was um, Hold is getting much, much, much higher ratings than the United States in terms of his capacity to get things done. I think that's how the, the um, poll was phrased. After the vast amount of humanitarian assistance that came from the American people, from the U.S. military, from the private sector, opinion in, in Indonesia has changed, and it's gotten much, much better toward the United States. But with the lesson for that is that it's very ephemeral and that we can't wait for the next crisis, the next terrorist attack, the next natural disaster to try to take serious steps to rebuild our credibility and legitimacy, which is truly at, at bottom line levels. And we saw this, we were talking earlier, that both parties are now 
trying to wrestle with what we do about America's image. Most recently, if you watch the hearings to confirm or not confirm the president's appointee to the UN ambassadorship of Senator Bolton, it's clear that, that, that we're having the beginnings of a course correction. Um, I want to say one last thing before I turn it over to the senator, which is that the most frequent question people ask and is asked in Washington about what we should do about America's image is that public diplomacy is the right answer and that we should spend several hundred million dollars on radio and television and, and try to win the hearts and minds of those out there who, who simply don't understand us, explain ourselves better. My feeling about public diplomacy is that public diplomacy was not responsible for getting us into this mess and can't possibly be expected to get us out of it. Public diplomacy worked during the Cold War because essentially we were seen as representing a credible approach to organizing world affairs as a decent alternative and offering a decent way of life. That has changed dramatically, and I think until we get our groove back in those big fundamental ways, public diplomacy is not the answer. But I know that Senator Feingold does have the answer. So um, <laughs> without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Julia Swig, uh, who has done uh, distinguished work uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I really am looking forward to your book. Uh, there really is almost nothing more important uh, for any of us than the research that you are doing, and I. Uh, it just this is in some ways the subject that we as Americans have to address. So thank you for doing that work, and I, I will read it. I want to thank Libby and Rob and everyone at both the Stimson Center and the UWM's Institute of World Affairs for working together in this event. Dr. Swig presented an interesting analysis of the nature of the problem before us. Millions of people around the globe who are suspicious of and even hostile toward the United States. Now, I agree with the doctor that there's simply an inherency here to a point. And when you're the most powerful country in the world and the Cold War is over, I remember when I became the first post-Cold War member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I thought this is going to be an interesting era, and I know one thing, there's going to be resentment toward us. I mean, that's, that's just axiomatic in human nature that that's going to happen. And, and so I thought about that a lot. I didn't articulate it. It wasn't sort of the thing that people were talking about, but I sort of realized that that was going to be a big deal. I had no idea <laughs> that I would ever see it in the form of September 11, 2001. On the other hand, uh, having watched sort of anti-Americanism throughout my life, I was struck when I went over to a trip for Africa in, in the middle of, uh, in, in February of 2003, just prior to the Iraq war. And I remember the protests all over the world, including the places I was going to. I was pretty sure, and I believe this is still the case, those were the worst and most consistent and worst anti-American protests in my lifetime. And I was part of protests in, against the Vietnam War uh, years ago. That was nothing compared, as you indicated, to the, the breadth and the depth of this kind of anti-American sentiment, which, of course, since then, since we fully engaged in the Iraq situation, I think is, is far worse. But I worry uh, that sometimes this overall issue is misunderstood, the issue of anti-Americanism. Th this is not about some kind of emotional need to be liked or a willingness to be swayed by public opinion. At its core, it's certainly when it comes to my work, this is about our interests. It's about our capacity and the willingness of others to cooperate with the United States at a time when we face threats from a global terrorist network which requires a global response. It's about our ability to build a safer, more just world for our children and our grandchildren. This is about American power, our power to persuade, to inspire, and to lead. This is also about the power of others and their capacity to distort our intentions, to try to misportray us as intolerant and aggressive and predatory. This is not a marginal issue or a soft issue. This is an essential issue. Perhaps the most important form of American power projected over the last century has been the power of our ideas and values. If we lose our capacity to lead in that sense, then all of us sitting here, all of us in government who have presided over the greatest loss of power in American history, regardless of how much we spend on our mighty military forces, that will be the result. 
And we will have put ourselves at a great disadvantage, maybe even a decisive and crippling disadvantage in the fight against terrorism. Dr. Swag's uh, analysis was comprehensive, and addressing the problems she flagged requires multifaceted action over the long term. But tonight I want to emphasize what I believe one of the most important elements of how we improve the world's perception of who we are as Americans and improve our understanding of the diverse societies beyond our borders. I am here today not to talk about public diplomacy. I'm here today because I believe the American people, every single one of you, have a critical role to play in strengthening our image abroad. This effort isn't just about the conduct of our diplomats at our embassies. Well, they certainly have a vital role to play. This effort must also be about the diplomacy of American citizens, who as individuals have a unique power to strengthen our relationships with people of different cultures and faiths around the world. To explain what I mean, and I'm sure you all would have examples, let me tell you about one experience I had while traveling abroad after the terrible attacks of September 11th. In 2002, I traveled to the sites of the 1998 embassy bombings. Tanzania, a country where about half the population is Muslim, is no stranger to suspicion and mistrust of the West. Yet as I found myself talking with a group of Tanzanian legislators, asking for their views of how to strengthen our partnership in combating terrorism and to improve the relationship between our countries, I was overwhelmed and touched by their amazing enthusiasm many years later for the Peace Corps, which quickly spilled over into enthusiasm for America. These distinguished legislators, many of whom are women, some of the first women ever to serve in the Tanzanian government, told me about how their first English language teachers were Peace Corps volunteers and how those teachers seemed to be opening the whole world to them just by their very presence in their classroom. These legislators said that the best way to strengthen our relations with their country was to foster meaningful people-to-people -people links by increasing our Peace Corps presence there. I was very moved by that meeting, not only because the University of Wisconsin is either number one or number two in the world in Peace Corps volunteers, and, and I believe we have many from this school as well. But, but the lasting impact that the American Peace Corps volunteers has had in the lives of the people they thought to serve, sought to serve. Now, I don't suggest, and this is important, that it's just going to be making a two-year commitment to the Peace Corps. But that's the only way you can do it. It doesn't have to be like that. It certainly doesn't mean that we should try to impose our views and values on the outside world. It means that we need to create and take advantage of opportunities to listen to others' perspectives, share ideas, and engage with the world outside of our borders. Americans are already creating these opportunities every day, connecting with people in other countries. These everyday acts dispel stereotypes and misperceptions about Americans that are dangerous to our security and our country's global leadership, and they help us to learn about what people outside of this country think. Here in Wisconsin, people have already amazed me with their altruism and commitment to these ideals. Way back in 1994, a man named Damon Shemansky, a retired dairy seed grain and grain producer from Pulaski, Wisconsin, had told me already what he was doing. He was training farmers in Brazil, Russia, Kazakhstan, Croatia, Ukraine, and other countries through the Farmer to Farmer Cooperative Development Program of ACDI VOCA. I remember the, he had just getting started in 94, and he told me that he went to a former Soviet Republic, went to a dairy farm. He said there was so much bacteria in the milk, the milk could walk market by itself. And I thought, this isn't good. And he taught them some of our Wisconsin abilities to fix that. That's a big deal when people reach out like that. Now he's done it like in 20 countries. Wisconsinites have also volunteered for Rotary International and traveled around the world with this great international movement to eliminate polio. And students and educators from Wisconsin universities have traveled to refugee camps in Thailand to assist Hmong Lao and Burmese refugees. Obviously, these are just a few examples. But they, they really do illustrate the point powerfully and well. The connections that these Wisconsinites are making will have a profound and lasting impact on how people in other nations view all of us as Americans. And they enrich our own communities here at home, giving us all a better understanding of how American policies affect the rest of the world. I'm proud of what these Americans are doing every day. They show um, what Americans know, but they also are willing to listen, to share knowledge, and to give themselves to help others. Now, one way to give this some some structure is I'm trying what I'm trying to do in the Senate is to encourage more Americans to find ways to engage with people in other countries. I've introduced the people to people uh, engagement and world affairs resolution with Republican Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska to do just that. 
The resolution urges Americans to look beyond our borders and to engage with the wider world at an individual human level by, for example, participating in a professional or cultural exchange, studying or volunteering abroad, working with an immigrant or refugee group in the United States, hosting a foreign student or professional, participating in a sister city program, or learning a foreign language. This resolution encourages Americans to become citizen ambassadors by forging relationships with people outside of the United States in order to break down the barriers that divide us, whether those barriers are cultural, ideological, or linguistic. As you all know, many Americans already want to engage with the rest of the world. They just don't know where to start. It's hard to kind of access this. I've been approached by Americans about how they can do it. They want to volunteer abroad to host students and the like. Many Americans know, as you do, that our world is interconnected and that so many of our problems are global in nature, and these challenges require international cooperation. Our world has become globalized in more ways than one. And when Americas do not engage, others certainly will. Let me sort of finish by telling you a little bit about a trip uh, that I took to, in January to the West African uh, country of Mali. The story starts, of all places, in Timbuktu, which we know is a long way away. I know I, uh, it's a kind of a, a far-fetched way to begin a story, but I was there earlier this year. I'd had the wonderful chance to visit that ancient city in the north of Mali, one of the great uh, ancient centers of Islamic learning, to visit with Muslim leaders and discuss their views of American policies to fight terrorism. Then we flew south to Mali's uh, capital, Bamako, for the next leg of the trip. When our plane landed, I got into a U.S. embassy car along with the American ambassador. As we drove along, I looked out the car window, and I saw that there were thousands of cheering Malians were lining the streets of the city which had been cleared for some kind of VIP travel. I was admit, I admit I was stunned. Uh, this was such a huge outpouring of enthusiasm for the American ambassador and an American senator. But then, of course, I found out the truth. They weren't there for us. <laughs> Believe it or not, they were there to greet the motorcade of Iranian President Khatami, whose plane had just landed at the airport. Well, apparently the last United States senator that had been to Mali was in 1999, a guy named Russ Feingold. I'm the only senator that even been to this place that's an awful long, it's farther away from Iran than it is from the United States. And here is the president of Iran getting a hero's welcome in this Western African country. I wasn't surprised that my own arrival went unnoticed, but I was struck by Mali's warm welcome for the Iranian leader and what it means for the U.S. It should be a real wake up call for American policymakers and for the American people that a struggling democracy like Mali would welcome Iran with open arms. In Mali, I suspect the government hopes to get some much-needed assistance from Iran, and I suspect that some Malians uh, felt a sense of solidarity with a country that seems to uh, embody resistance to some of the global economic and social trends that seem to uh, have sometimes often left Mali behind. But Iran is hardly the only nation reaching out to struggling countries that are neglected by U.S. policymakers. Saudi money is funding the establishment of extremist schools and mosques around the world. The Chinese government is offering the kind of tangible support all across Africa that creates goodwill and longstanding relationships, building roads and soccer stadiums, making long-term loans, and trying to secure access to African oil markets. The Malians I met, like the Algerians and Nigerians and Kenyans I've met on other trips to the region, don't seem to hate the U.S., although many have grave concerns about some of our policies. They're happy to discuss their views on terrorism when asked about the issue, but they're even more interested in talking about their priority, the fight against poverty, the struggle for reason, to hope that life for their children will be better than life is today. If they believe that Americans are not interested in their concerns, it will have serious implications for our security in the post-9-11 world. And we have neglected them. United States policy toward many struggling Muslim nations is either short-sighted, underfunded, or in many cases, both. Take Somalia, where we have no policy at all. Or Tanzania, where we don't even have an ambassador. Even though the terrorists, these same terrorists, attacked our embassy there in 1998, we don't have an ambassador there. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of examples. We are not doing enough to listen to the concerns of these nations and our indifference is creating a vacuum that others whose interests may clash with our own can fill all too easily. Part of the solution lies with our government, which must do a better job of reaching out to other nations, but part of it lies with the American people. With you and with me, we must find ways to engage with those countries and those people. On the same trip where I traveled to Mali, I also went to Algeria, 
where I met with the president of Algeria's Islamic Council. This respected Muslim leader, a moderate by all accounts, told me straight out that the United States is perceived as being hostile to Islam. As he put it, our hostile attitude is, quote, plain, like the sun in the middle of the day. To hear this account of American attitudes firsthand from such a moderate voice in the Muslim world was troubling indeed. At her confirmation hearing earlier this year, Condoleezza Rice told the Foreign Relations Committee that when the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States was, quote, merely harvesting the good decisions of wise and far-sighted statesmen in the late 1940s. It's time to plan again for a generational effort to commit to a policy of engagement, to plant a new crop of wisdom. The U.S. must engage with Muslim communities and offer tangible support to struggling nations, and we must do so at every level, public and private. Because when people of Muslim nations or any nation think about the United States, all the formal diplomacy in the world may not matter as much as what they learned from a Wisconsin dairy farmer they met through a training program or the friendship they built with a Peace Corps volunteer. It is those personal connections that can change minds and misperceptions. Those are the relationships that truly bring nations closer together and can overcome the differences of history. If we can strengthen our diplomacy at every level, citizen to citizen as well as ambassador to ambassador, we can change the misperceptions about Americans that threaten not just our image, but our very security in the post-9-11 world. We can show the world the true face of America, a nation of great generosity and caring, with a strong commitment to cultural exchange and to learning about the wider world. That's the nation we know, and it's the one we must share with other nations around the world to secure a better, safer future for ourselves and for future generations. Thank you for including me. We'll have a, a mic set up here. If you've got questions on your question cards, there'll be people moving through the audience um, and staff just pass them over to the ends and we can take them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, let me start off with uh, 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 one of the written questions. Um, and, and I suppose this is to the, to the panel. Uh, please comment on differences, the difference between how American values are perceived abroad and how they are perceived domestically. How does this difference or disconnect contribute to anti-Americanism, and how can it be bridged? I guess I'll say a word or two. I, I remember I was in uh, another place you think you'd never be, uh, Zanzibar. And I, I, oh, is this not? I'm sorry. So a place that I, another place I never thought it'd be, Zanzibar, which is actually part of Tanzania, an island off of, it sort of used, used to be its own country. And I, you know, I was, Hosted the state dinner was hosted for me, you know, because I was like the only American that had ever shown up there, and and I was talking to the president of Zanzibar, and I sort of asked him, you know, what do you know about the United States? And he only knew two names, first of all, basically Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods. That's that's who he knew, and the sense I got from him and other people was, I don't, I'm not sure that they have the clearest sense of what what we perceive to be American values are. What they perceived was wealth and military strength. It's what I hear from so many people on these trips, that these are the lasting impressions that they have. I'm sure, obviously, there are people that are aware of our commitment to democracy and human rights, but I'm afraid that those um, things tend to overwhelm uh, too often. I don't know if you'd agree with that. I, I agree entirely. <laughs> Um, I can't get this to pull any farther, so no, I'll just um, just a small anecdote that's similar. Um, my international frame of mind was this, those seeds were planted because I spent a year between high school and college with the American Field Service in Madrid not long after democracy had come to Spain and uh, really had my mind opened and got a foreign language down through that year of living in Spain. And 
made some friendships along the way and lived in San Francisco at the time when I was in college. And one young man who was a music teacher from the south of Spain came to visit, and he had been an AFS student too. And he looked at me one morning at breakfast, and my mother was sitting there, and he said, do you have any idea how violent your country is? And I, I was absolutely stunned by this because I did not myself think of our country as a violent country at the time, especially growing up in, at this time in San Francisco in the 70s. But um, we were... <laughs> We were a rainbow country, and um, no, honestly, but 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 there is a, a perception that that, and part of that is fed by Hollywood and television, and part of it is fed by statistics, by gun ownership, by the 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 views that that guns are part of freedom. That's a very anathema idea for for many people around the world. More recently, there's been, a, and I'll just stop in this, there's been a, a sort of sense that there is a values clash between Europe and the United States. Of course, we have a strong sense of the importance of the individual, of the market, whereas in Europe, the notion that a society, there's a social contract where this relationship between the state and society is, is a lot stronger than, than the one we have here. There is a clash of values. Um, but I think that that has been maybe unnecessarily inflated in this most recent context, and that that values piece of it might fade a bit if we were to get the other aspects of it in line. Great. Thank you. Let's take a question from the floor while we're waiting for more written questions to come up. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Tahir Khan. I'm the president of Ahmadiyya Muslim Student Association here at UWM. And I would like to thank everybody for putting this program together. It's a great <laughs> program. And I have a question um, for Senator Feingold. As uh, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, fundamentalism moves from its hardbacks like in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, to other South Asian countries like Bangladesh and poses a threat to the human rights of different minorities living in Bangladesh, uh, what do you think should be the American strategy towards combating rise in Islamic fundamentalism without increasing anti-Americanism? To deal with... with uh Fundamental Islamic fundamentalism without what? Without increasing anti-Americanism. Well, you know, that's a real good way to look at this, is to compare the way that the United States prepared for the war in Afghanistan versus Iraq. Um, I was impressed with the way the Bush administration led up to the invasion of Iraq. They put Colin Powell out front. He went all over and, and was very careful to work closely with the Islamic countries and develop a, and, and not immediately attack. They waited for 30 days and they made sure that there was this sense that this was the whole world community against terrorists. And, you know, I'm sure there are those who didn't even believe in that action, but that was one way of doing it. The other way was this uh, way of getting into the war in Iraq, which, you know, I think many people around the world were ready to believe when the president said after 9-11, this is not a war against Islam. This is against people that attacked us. Well, then when you go into a country with false premises and those premises fall apart, what is a young Muslim to believe? They're naturally going to assume that this was chapter two of the war against Islam. That's, that's the wrong way to go about it. Now, I will say this because you mentioned Bangladesh and Pakistan. We cannot ignore the repression that those governments uh, and some of the fundamentalist approach are imposing on people. And we cannot simply say, well, we need Pakistan in the fight against terrorism, so we overlook these things. We have to pressure the government uh, of Pakistan and the other governments to not do that. Um, we met with President Musharraf recently, and it's very important when the U.S. senators meet with the president. You, you may thank him for the help in the war against terrorism, but you can't let him off the hook. For example, in the terrible way women are treated in terms of the criminal law in Pakistan. So, it, it, and I think we tend to err on the side of being a little too flattering toward these leaders rather than, than firm. Great. Thanks. Let's take one more from the floor. First of all, I want to tell you what a great pleasure it is for me to be here with you, yes. Senator. I've, I come from Illinois, and I've admired you for years. Uh, now my zinger. <laughs> How much of the anti-U.S. feeling in the world today is due to the realization of those nations 
that the great paradigm of liberal internationalism has broken down in the United States and Americans are increasingly reluctant to invest our finances, our material resources, and particularly our manpower in a futile effort to solve all the problems of these people that they are unable to solve themselves. I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. You're saying that the perception in the other countries would be based on a belief that we are doing what in this country? That the attitude, the liberal international paradigm that has, well, Americans believed in since World War II has been breaking down for the past two decades. And I think these countries are realizing it. And this is part of their uh, reaction to us. I think the doctor knows more about this. My sense is, my sense is based on my more anecdotal experiences, that's probably true. I don't know how deep it's penetrated in a lot of these countries. I'm not sure that the average citizens or even some of the leaders in some of the countries I go to really understand that phenomenon of our country. But I, I'm going to defer to her because I think you would know more. I think the, you, you correctly identify, and I agree with you, that the phenomenon is present. The, is the United States has pulled back in many ways from a notion, at least maintaining an artifice that consensus-based international collective action. Say we've been mugged by reality. That, that would be the line. Um, so I think that is an element of it. And, and you know, somebody else called it walking into the plate glass window of reality. Um, I think it, we're maybe undergoing a course correction right now where showing the world that we do want to engage internationally in international institutions comes to have its own benefit on its face for American security. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, is, there, is there a notion, I mean, I've, I've heard this in several foreign countries where there's this twin presumption related to what you're saying that the U.S., if it wanted to, could do anything because it is all powerful. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's not doing anything about our problem here, indebtedness, right. you know, quality of life, whatever it is. So therefore, they must want us to be in that. It's almost the, uh, the other side of what you're saying, Nathan, that because things are bad, it must be their fault. Um, they must have intended this way. So it kind of maybe goes to this expectations problem you, you talked about earlier that can't be fulfilled. When you're perceived as being wealthy and, and investing in military power, it, it, in a place like Mali, that I keep mentioning, it's, it, you know, they've got wonderful potential there. But they don't see us as doing even uh, the minimum that we think. They're very pleasant to us when we can, but you can just feel mm -hmm. this sense that it isn't even close to what they consider to be the minimum that we could do. And, and this is part of the downside of having as much power as we have, which is these vastly overheated expectations. On the one hand, on the other hand, exactly what Rob says, a sense that we, we have the capacity to do anything we choose to, so if we're not doing it, it's deliberate. And if we are doing it, it's deliberate. Um, that, I think, is, is a, a structural element of this anti-American moment that, again, is regardless of party and power, it is a structural aspect that we confront that, that eventually perhaps China and India and the EU will confront, and we won't. Can I, Thank can I, you so much. Thanks. Uh, a couple of questions uh, going to some of the same point. Uh, don't you think that anti-Americanism is more about our government's foreign policy than about how individuals act abroad? Uh, even if the rhetoric should improve, uh, people will still sort of judge us by our, our, our actions uh, in, in the world. So, so basically saying, yes, uh, if I hear these questions right, it's, uh, these things are important, but, but isn't it, or isn't most of it still our, our our, our, our policies that we follow versus sort of the people-to-people the -people context. I think the actions really do matter, and I think that this is why I'm so uh, down about what happened between Afghanistan and Iraq, because I, I remember the outpouring of what I believe to be an awful lot of genuine concern for the United States and, and what, when the terrorist attack occurred. The messages we got from all the African countries seemed really quite sincere. And I believe that there was a window there for people to look at us differently. We'd gotten hurt. We, we can suffer pain, too. We're not always the ones that have the advantages. And, and I felt that something was happening there. 
and uh, that could have that could have been grown into something that, like you say, it was not, not just a course correction, but even beyond that. I thought it was dramatic what was happening, and I was excited about it, and I feel like it was stopped in its tracks uh, by the mistake of going into Iraq the way we did. And obviously, we still have to try to fix it, but it, it put us in a, a terrible disadvantage. So, yeah, I, I think. I think major decisions like that at critical junctures when everybody's watching have an enormous impact on what people think of us. Julie, do you want to come in? No, let's take the next question. Okay. Great. Yeah, question. Hi, my name is Zach Orr. I'm a junior here at UWM. I'm a political science major. I want to thank the panel for their expertise and their dedication to these topics. Um, I think that it's imperative when we're looking at anti-Americanism to look at our role in Middle Eastern politics, especially foreign policy. With this in mind, um, what is the significance of our $50 million contribution that was recently made to Palestine? And also, should Jerusalem remain under Israeli control, or should sovereignty be shared between Israel and a new Palestinian state? What was the first figure, the $50 million? What is the significance of the $50 million contribution that we have recently given to Palestinian I thought government? it was greater than that, but um, the significance is that, that we believe that uh, Mr. Abbas, Abu Mazen, is, is a serious person who wants to work seriously with Ariel Sharon, who, much to my surprise, has proven to be a person who wants to seriously engage in peace process. Uh, that's a recognition that pr real progress is being made. Uh, we Several of us met last week with, with Mr. Abbas. And I'll tell you, it was a very different experience in meeting with Yasser Arafat. Um, you know, I, I worked with Arafat the best I could, but it, it was like kind of putting your hand through a mirage. This guy seems much more serious about completing. So th this is a recognition that we believe this is one of those moments, although we've all been led to the altar of peace many times, this appears to be a moment of hope. What should happen in Jerusalem? Well, I think we should leave that up to the Palestinian and the Israelis to work out. You know what they tell you over there. That's not the big problem. They think it is. People think it is because it's so emotional. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out with this, these shrines and this thing and, and, and so on. You know, they all want to... Everybody there wants to be able to visit their holy sites and to have some claim to Jerusalem. There, there is no way that Israel would ever agree, nor would I agree, to it be an international city or it should be the capital of Israel in my view. Uh, but there may be arrangements that allow uh, the Palestinian state to have certain privileges and recognitions of that kind. I, don't, I think if everything else gets worked out, my belief is that, that we used to think that was the thing that would hold up the peace process. I think it's more, uh, you know, the issue of the settlements and the, the shape that the West Bank will take that will ultimately be the, they'll be the hardest things to work on. Julie, you I, I wasn't going to comment on this, but, but I feel that I have to, and that's because it is true that the, the issue of American policy with Israel and on the question of a viable Palestinian state has been the source of tremendous anti-Americanism in the Middle East and also in European capitals, by the way. Um, but I've thought a lot about this, and I'm, I don't really think that it would be honest to argue that if peace breaks out in Israel and the Palestinians and Israelis settle Jerusalem and all of that, that tomorrow anti-Americanism will decline all that substantially. Because at the end of the day, the United States only has so much leverage with Israel. And there's this very strong caricature misconception, and it, it's anti-Semitic and anti-American, and it's where the two meet when you get into the European salons and also in the Middle East, that says that you know Israel is is our, that we're Israel's patron and therefore we can make Sharon do X or Y or we are choosing not, the reason he's not doing X or Y is because we're not putting enough pressure. To the extent that that settles, great. It would be very important and it will temper some of the anti-Americanism, but, but I don't think it would answer 80, 90 percent of I wanna, it. I want to follow on that because I think it's one of the most important things anyone can say. There is a belief on the part of the American left in particular that this whole thing comes down to the Arab-Israeli conflict. That doesn't make any sense. 
put it either way. Let's say that the Israel ceased to exist, or let's say peace breaks out. Does anyone really believe the things that she studied from Indonesia to the Philippines? Or do you really think on a day-to-day -day basis people are thinking about that? They will mention it. It is absolutely God's truth. That everywhere you go in the world, if you ask what are the, some of the things that America is doing wrong, they will always mention this. But there's no logic. If anyone thinks that's going to be the crux of this world problem, we're kidding ourselves. It has to be resolved. There has to be security for the Israeli people. There has to be justice and a state for the Palestinian people. But it's not what this is about. It's symbolic of it. But it's not at the heart of it. And so we need to think more broadly, I think, about the broader global issues, the African issues, the Southeast Asian issues, the issues of Islam and the changing face of Islam, and not think that somehow resolving this issue between, I think, a couple of peoples that are going to be pretty good friends over <laughs> these days, believe it or not, that that's going to solve the bigger issue. We've got um, a couple of questions here. That, uh, a question that really looks at several of these questions that were submitted uh, in writing, and they have to do with the role of education and two aspects of that. One is looking at uh, the importance of language training for uh, U.S. students, and that language training in this current environment of fiscal cutbacks is being eliminated in many schools, and so that that, in terms of being prepared to engage with the world, we're, we're doing a less uh, good job of preparing people on the issue of language training. The other aspect looks at the incoming portion of education and that it's becoming more difficult for foreign students to come and study in the United States. They may be the people that were taught by a Peace Corps worker and then decided to get their master's degree at, at, at the UW system or something, but now have a hard time doing that. Um, and, and maybe so you can comment perhaps on the role of education, both educating our, our, our youth here in the United States as well as bringing in people from abroad to study here. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I say this immodestly, but I and many people that I know and many of you in the audience, I'm sure, and the senator and, and Libby and Rob, all of us have an international perspective precisely because at a young age we went abroad and lived and learned about the way other people see us and see themselves and developed that core issue that is so important which is empathy and I don't say that in a sort of soft power namby pamby way it's a it's a it's a hard power national security issue which is and I, there's a great piece that I'll just refer it to you in the Atlantic that I read on the plane coming out, which talks about why in World War II the American interrogators of Japanese prisoners of war were so successful. Why? Because they uh, learned the basic issue of hearts and minds and empathy. See others as they see themselves and see yourself as others see you. Y punto. So, um, language is absolutely essential and bringing people here. We always, when I was growing up, hosted kids from abroad. We went abroad and did it. And I don't know, can we make it a law in our country that you require <laughs> high school, you don't get a diploma? Well, I, the, Over to you. this subject is a source of mortal embarrassment for me. My mother, who just passed away three months ago, was a brilliant linguist. She knew five languages. And in my little rebellion, I decided not to learn any. <laughs> and uh, it was an enormous mistake. But you see, what it tells you is somebody like me at that time considered a good student, somebody that was well-educated, went to the top school. And I was considered educated, and I, you know, my mother wasn't even happy with my English. She'd say, she said this to me two years ago. She said, you went to Oxford and you're still using the same grammar? My 84-year-old mother. But it tells you something about our mindset. It, when we were growing up, at least my age, it wasn't considered necessarily the mark of a well-educated person if you knew a foreign language, which is absurd and dangerous to our security. So I don't, I'm not going to pass a federal mandate that everybody has to learn a language, but no, we've got... No, we, we've they got, have to go abroad before they get well, a diploma. I'm not going to mandate either, but that would be more probably more appealing to people. But um, <laughs> we have to do something fundamental about this language problem. It is not moving fast enough. And then when we don't even keep let people work for us in the Defense, defense Department that know Arabic because they're gay, that just shows you how completely out of touch we are with reality on this thing. On the students... You probably know more about this, but 
On the issue of the students uh, coming in here, this, you know, talk to the <coughs> chancellor of the university, this is a terrible threat to us, that great students wouldn't come here. Uh, some of my Islamic friends here in Wisconsin have told me that some major institutions are creating uh, camp campuses in the Middle East and the oil-rich states and, and just cutting the United States out of the picture, which is a great threat to our institutions and our country. Okay. Yeah, question. Uh, I'm sorry, Lou. I just wanted to add a little bit of uh, uh, statistical information to the issue of foreign language learning as a, as a national security issue. Um, at the close of last year, there was this big scandal about um, a spy satellite program estimated to cost about $10 billion that would have been duplicative, essentially, of what we have out there already doing space imaging related to intelligence gathering. GAO, the, the Government Accounting Office, did, uh, did a couple of reports over the last two years about foreign language as an issue for um, U.S. government agencies. And between the State Department, the Pentagon, uh, CIA, FBI, uh, Commerce Department, et cetera, et cetera, you have somewhere between a 10 percent and 40-something percent gap in terms of what they need to do their jobs and the people coming to the to the table who speak the languages that are of need within those agencies. Now, I bring up the $10 billion satellite program because the only federal program we have for foreign language learning related to our national security needs is a $15 million endowment in the in the defense uh, department. So you see how out of out of balance we've aligned, you know, how misaligned our priorities are with respect to foreign language learning vis-a-vis -vis the hardware element of providing for our national security. Some of these things boil down to very fundamental human resource capacity, and foreign language is a big one. I just wanted – oh, one other little uh, statistical fact. GAO found that annually the increase in need because of how high-tech intelligence gathering capacities have become, that annual increase is 30 percent. But we're still not doing anything different in terms of training people for those for those slots within our our federal agencies. Thanks, Louis. From the floor, yes. Uh, I'm Halim Mustafa, and I'm a graduate student at Marquette University. Um, my question is: instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars on improving our image, why not save ourselves hundreds of billions of dollars spent on the illegal occupation of Iraq or Palestine, including East Jerusalem? Uh, I'm a Muslim, and I know how Muslims think. I, I've been all over the region, and I know that the Israeli occupation is the major, the, the U.S. support for, for Israel is the major concern, uh, and we view that uh, the invasion of Iraq and uh, the situation with Iran and Syria is also not just for the oil, but to protect Israel from any balancing powers in the region, and, and you would find that also in the Israeli newspapers and, and read the statements of Israeli leaders. Thank you. Well, I will tell you that there is no way I believe that the major motive of the Bush administration is, is to protect Israel. I'm sure that that is a goal. But I don't really think it serves anybody to believe that that's all that's going on here. It's much more fundamental. I think it has to do with resources for the United States, and in part oil. Obviously, it has to do in part with this ideology that they apparently have, this neoconservative ideology. But, you know, that doesn't take away from your point that this idea of spending $5 billion a month in this Iraqi situation, that, you know, we're attacked as a country, and the next move we make after Afghanistan is to invade a country that wasn't even on the Bush administration's list of 45 countries where al-Qaeda was operating. It, it just and – it, and it created such negative feelings, and it is enormously expensive. I mean – you know, you could just take the military out. The $20 billion that we are spending on or trying to spend on reconstruction in Iraq is greater than apparently all our foreign aid, all our foreign aid completely. $17 billion for all the rest of the foreign yeah, aid. Yeah, people talk about $3 billion to Israel. Yeah, that's a lot. But it is a fraction of what's being spent on a reconstruction where they can't even monitor the projects. When I was in Iraq, I asked them, well, how... How do you get out and find out if they're building these projects? Because it's not safe. They go, well, we send these little unmanned vehicles, and they take a picture to see if a wall's been built. 
That's the kind of accountability that American taxpayers are getting because this was such an ill-conceived thing. So I think it is not money well spent. So do you want to come on? Yeah. Myrtle. I am Myrtle Kastner. I was a foreign science student here a long time ago, but I've been keeping up. Uh, as to the reconstruction of Iraq, I think that was very well conceived. The CEO of Halliburton is currently vice president. He'll be CEO of Halliburton after this administration. As Deep Throat said a while back, follow the money. Uh, I had a couple of points to make. Yes, it is much broader than just Israel, Palestine. This country over the years has committed crimes around the world. In Chile, they are finally possibly going to indict Pinochet, but not his co-conspirator. Mr. Kissinger is still considered an elder statesman, statesman, not before the bar of law. Okay, so part of the anti-Americanism is from what we have done and what we continue to do to many countries around the world for various purposes. Part of it is the arrogance, as exemplified by Condi Rice going around the world saying, you must do this. We say so. And part of it is the utter hypocrisy Another Condi Rice quote recently when she was talking about getting Syria out of Lebanon, you cannot have free elections under military occupation. Thank you. And any comments or are you going to let that stand? I thought it was a good statement. <laughs> Uh, let me um, let me take another uh, one of the written uh, questions that, that came in. Um, I'll just read this one out. How, how do you think our inability to present a legitimate and credible America to the world has to do with divisions within the United States itself, uh, divisions among, among political, race, class lines, for example? What was the for example? Uh, looking at political divisions, racial divisions, class divisions. Etc. So the question is, is, is if, because Thank these divisions you, are. I love that question. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think it's fundamental because although the. I, I think during the most recent presidential election campaign, our divisions, red, blue, the polarization, may have been exaggerated because they're a great story to tell and we know there's blue and red and red and blue and purple and all sorts of shades in between. I mean we've all grown up here and have a sense that that portrayal in the media was maybe exaggerated. But having said that, I do think that we are divided and the polls show that we are divided over the use of force over the UN over climate change, over these basic issues of how America should project itself abroad. And they do cut pretty much along partisan lines. And they do put, if I can be very um, general, blue state values roughly in line with sort of, um, old Europe. And old Europe, of course, is not the only international audience that the United States has to relate to. But I do think that if you look at foreign coverage of the United States in the last few years, what you see is a, a, an acute awareness of our divisions internally. And um, although but it, it's complex in the Congress and the vote for the resolution for the Iraq war was a bipartisan vote. Some individuals didn't vote for it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But, so on the one hand, on the one hand, we're very, very divided, and that makes it very difficult to project a unified image of what America is about. 
On the other hand, much of our international trespasses during the Cold War and in this most recent period are really seen as bipartisan by those looking at us abroad. The Kerry campaign um, was not in its foreign policy particularly distinguishable from the Bush campaign's foreign policy. Um, and that was, I mean, you didn't have to be looking at us abroad. We all could see that. Uh, the day that the senator said that they would have voted for the resolution even had he known what he known now sort of sealed that deal. And, and I say that lovingly and as a God-fearing Democrat, but that was the, 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 the reality. So, so I think our divisions help hurt, hurt us abroad, but we perceive them to be much more, perceive ourselves to be more divided than, than we are seen abroad. We're seen essentially as monolithic abroad. But just this last thing, over the, the John Bolton nomination, you really saw there that our partisan divisions really do prevent us, hopefully they, they won't, but I think they will prevent us from doing the right thing in terms of our projection abroad, and we'll probably send somebody to the UN that has no business being there precisely if what we're interested in, in is repairing our image abroad. Yeah, next. Um, I'd just like to say, start up by saying thanks, and I think we're really, really lucky just in Wisconsin just to have such a wonderful resident, or such a wonderful senator, um, and I think he's really worthy of a, of a round of applause. And but, um, but just getting to my question, um, I used to be a Muslim myself, and uh, I did convert to Christianity. And a growing number of Christian fundamentalists like myself believe that Islam, uh, well, a lot, of, a lot of them believe that Islam is the enemy or destined to Antichrist. And since Islamic Jihad is inherent in the Quran, when you become president, how will you address this belief, especially with the growing reality that there probably will be another major terrorist attack on this country in the name of Islam? Uh, the notion that Islam is hostile to, uh, that it's, it supports terrorism or that it has a, a violent jihad approach is, is just wrong. It is. I've read the Koran and that's not true and I'm sure none of you have. Of the, it's one of the cruelest distortions of, of a religion. As a Jew, I have remembered the attempts to write vicious documents about Judaism that have been distributed throughout the centuries and are still used. And uh, I just want you to know, I hope you look at this again, because that simply does not reflect, reflect the beauty and the wisdom of Islam, which is one of the great religions in the world. And every American needs to take the time to learn what almost all Muslims believe, and it is not that there should be a violent war to subjugate the world. I simply reject that. I want to get to just another one of the uh, written, written questions, and again, go, going to sort of specific U.S. policies and possibly changing them. Uh, the question notes that Tom Friedman of the New York Times recently, I'm not making that hum, I swear, um, uh, recently called for the closing down of the Guantanamo prison facility, saying its existence is leading to the loss of more lives than those saved by the incarceration of, quote, bad people. So comment on that, I suppose, as, as a sort of a, 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 a it really goes to this whole notion of of torture and treatment of prisoners that we've seen beyond Guantanamo, um, but but to what extent are those policies causing us more loss of life than than perhaps saving? Well, I can't say for sure, but I, I can say that uh, having watched uh, various institutions from School of the Americas to the Abu Ghraib prison to Guantanamo, there clearly comes a point where continuing a particular institution. Uh, becomes so symbolic and negative that even if certain legitimate functions are occurring at the institution, the downside is enormous. I, you know, I haven't sort of yet thought about whether or not I'm going to call for shutting down Guantanamo, but Tom is a pretty measured, cautious guy. Friedman supported the Iraq War, and he and I have argued about that and, and disagreed on it. So he's not somebody who would lightly uh, say 
that the downside of this and the consequences are, are serious. He's, he's, in fact, more than often than not talking about how this Iraq thing can work out. So I'm going to reread uh, that column and, and, and think about it because, I, and I also, uh, this idea that the Abu Ghraib prison is still there, so it becomes a source of another attack. There must be a way we can do these, change these institutions around to get away from the symbolism of it. Great. Did you comment? If I could just say, and the substance of it. In, Back to the, the issue of the successful Japanese interrogation. Torturing suspects does not yield information. That's been established. Um, so so I, I think we need to deal appropriately to protect ourselves, but I don't see that the substance of what's taking place at Bagram or Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo advances their security needs in any way. And just to sort of layer something on about Guantanamo itself, you know, I got into this issue of anti-Americanism through the window of Latin America, which is sort of one of the original cradles of anti-Americanism, and Cuba, of course, you know, remember Guantanamo is actually Cuban territory. We've been writing a check to Fidel Castro for a couple of thousand bucks a year that he puts in a drawer in his desk. I've seen the drawer with the checks in them. Um, Guantanamo is a, a, a territory that we possess against the will of the owner of the country, you know, of the territory. You don't say owner, but you get my drift. So there's, Guantanamo is pregnant with symbolism even prior to its current detention and torture uh, activities there. So I think it would be worth reconsidering. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Angela Ratkowski. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, so I appreciate how highly the senator was speaking of the Peace Corps. Which country? Benin. Benin. Okay. And uh, my question is about Sudan. And I'm wondering if the senator could talk a little about what Congress is doing to address the genocide there, knowing that ignoring the situation can only contribute to a negative worldview of America, especially on the part of developing nations in Africa. Let me, let me talk about this in two ways, because one reality is that we are, doing, we are engaged in the Sudan issue, which is a terrible tragedy, but this Congress and this president aren't paying any attention, basically, to the deaths of three million people in Congo. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because it has to do with whether or not Christians are being persecuted. Of course, the persecution of Christians is an unacceptable thing, and, and that has led many fundamentalist Christians in the Congress who normally don't pay any attention to Africa to get involved in the Sudan issue. Now, this has to do with the North-South issue. The Sudan issue. So this is how Sudan got on the radar screen in the first place. But I do want to appeal to everybody here. As you remember Rwanda, there are things like that going on in Africa right now that while we're paying some attention to Sudan, we're paying no attention whatsoever to genocidal situations. We've got to get away as a country from not having real standards based on genocide and, and, and uh, horrendous treatment of people. It can't just be based, again, on a somewhat domestic political judgment. Second thing is has to do with Sudan itself. Of course it's good news, and the United States did do a good job of trying to negotiate an agreement between the North and the South in Sudan, and we hope that succeeds. The problem is, is there's so much commitment to that, there's a tendency not to be as strong as we can about Darfur and about the, the problems in the western part of the country. We started off being stronger than the rest of the world on it, but I think we've flagged lately. A special, a Danforth, before he became U.N. ambassador, was appointed a special envoy to negotiate the North-South Agreement. A number of us have called for a special envoy to try to have the United States every day have somebody very important, very significant, whether it's Colin Powell or whoever it would be, over there just trying to stop this genocide. And they haven't done it. We've asked them for months and months to take serious action in this regard. And instead, they're saying, well, the African Union's going to do it. Well, that's a good idea to have them help, but they're not able on their own at this point to handle this entire situation. So we have to be more aggressive in the Congress and the President and to force the Security Council to put real sanctions on the Sudanese government and not allow them to move forward with what they want, which are normalization of relations with us and other countries, to not allow them to move forward with some of this other stuff until they clean up their act in Darfur. So we've got a lot more to do. 
Thank Let me take uh, one more written in and one more question from, from, from the floor. A couple of questions about the quality of information that reaches policymakers and particularly uh, the, the administration and, and asking, you know, to, to how serious is, and this question is the administration's ignorance and misinformation about it and how it is playing in a generated anti-Americanism in the world, but extends that, another question or two, extends that more broadly to the policymaking establishment. Um, to what extent are people making well-informed judgments? Are they being driven by more, mostly really domestic policy concerns and what needs to be done to, to basically improve how we make decisions? In terms of the information we get? Yeah, and both the both administra on the administrative, administration side and on the congressional side. Well, there's a real problem with, with the kind of information that even the, the, the administration, even the CIA and these folks get. Uh, you know, I tried to ask these guys the other day uh, what was really going in, on in Iran. You know, what is the relationship between Iran and al-Qaeda? And I, I can't give you the specific answers, but really there's not much to tell. Uh, today there was a report that Zarqawi might be in Iran getting medical care. Why don't we know? If we really had, if we, of course, if we had a real presence there and in other countries of the world of Americans, we would have ways to know, but we don't, and we also have this language problem. So I, I have this kind of sick feeling that even our people that won't tell me what they're supposed to tell me don't know. You know, they're not, they don't tell us nearly what they should tell us. So that's a, a bad feeling. Then you get it all the way distilled down to Congress. First of all, you have to have somebody's attention. It has to be a member of Congress who cares about it, and that's, you know, on each issue it's just a handful. And there's a question mark about, you know, the quality of what we get. And, and, and thank God there are NGOs and there are uh, civil society people and institutions like yours and others that, that help us at least raise the right questions and follow some of these things through. But it's very difficult because we finally get to something and then we have to – it's classified – and then we can't talk about it. So they got us all tied up in knots when it comes to information a lot of times. Libby, did you want to comment? Um, I, Rob alluded to the fact that, that I and my colleague are embedded on Capitol Hill on an ongoing basis, and essentially what we do is run um, an ongoing, ongoing bipartisan, off-the-record uh, briefing series for staff specifically to get international policy experts in front of the people who need that information the most in a very user-friendly form, and again, in a safe venue, so that they can actually ask real questions instead of trying to score political points. Um, I think it's been a, a tremendously valuable resource for the staff people who come to the sessions and participate. But one, one thing that the senator alluded to in terms of think tanks and the role that they play, I've been out there uh, you know, pounding the, the pulpit over the last year for think tanks to turn that academic, you know, that dense 450-page tome on whatever subject into something that is useful to the policymaker because that tome is of new, no use to somebody on the Hill. Page and a half. A page and a half, <laughs> double-spaced, 14-point font. What do you want me to do about it? And get it up there, get it up there quick and make, you know, make it of, of some utility to the policymakers because the glossy reports aren't doing the trick. Uh, having done a briefing for Stimson, the two instructions I had were say, why should Congress care and what should they do about it? So, yeah, let's take a quick last question. Respectfully, Senator, as uh, remember, September 11th is the constant battle cry for the Bush administration's war on terror without and within their vision anyway. Are you concerned about the serious and compromising omissions and distortions in the official 9-11 Commission report as identified by many researchers, including Dr. David Ray Griffin in his book, The 9-11 Commission Report, and will you support this constituent's plea for a new and truly independent and complete investigation for 9-11 truth? Well, I believe that the commissions that we've already had have very, very serious questions that cast ser very serious doubt already on the administration's conduct. I, I don't feel like they gave them a, a very good grade. Uh, it's, it was deeply disturbing uh, to, to hear and to, to realize that the, the failures are already there. I don't know exactly what you're getting at in terms of what further investigation you want. I Certainly, if there's things that have not been uh, looked at carefully, I would always want well, to learn more, and I have a feeling we're going to be learning more about more. this for quite some time. Excuse me. A simple example, an error of omission would be 
the complete lack of addressing the uh, question of the instantaneous destruction of the World Trade Tower Number 7, uh, and that conflict with a statement by that building's owner on national media that he decided with the Fire Department and Police Department of New York City to pull the building. This subject is not addressed in any way in the official 9-11 Commission report, and there are many other examples. But let's, uh, let's, one last comment, and then we should, we should wrap. I, I'll, like, I'll have to look at that and, and learn about it. I'm going to supply your staff with a copy of Dr. Griffin's uh, lecture on this subject. Would you consider reviewing? Would you review that? I will try to read it. Uh, is it a page and a half? <laughs> just give me a hard you time. Can I, it, I will certainly you can plug try the DVD in over I'll look in it. over some popcorn at home. I'll look at it. Thank you. Let me um, let me just say a couple other uh, thank yous. Uh, Susan Yelich Minetsky and Rachel Schrag from the Institute who helped put this event together really worked tirelessly on, on that. Let me also put in a plug again for the Institute. I mean, one thing we try to do is get people informed about these issues so that they can make decisions, that they can participate in the policy making process. So, again, another pitch out for the Institute. And please join me in thanking our panel again, Dr. Julie Schwag, Senator Russ Feingold. Please uh, fill out your evaluations. Thank you so much.